second workshop consists of two parts. So uh, in the morning, we will have uh, two lectures for the school, and in the afternoon, we will have a workshop, uh, except the schedule on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, one lecturer from uh, uh, Professor Kokotas had uh, some family problems, so uh, he will not be able to appear here. So we will have some sky, uh, lecture by Skype. Okay. And uh, because of this uh, new situation of novel coronavirus, uh, there are many, some, some uh, Workshop talks were canceled, so we have uh, plenty of time. So you can uh, take your time, especially lecturers and uh, uh, speakers, you can uh, take your time as you want. So let us do it uh, slowly. And uh, for the lunch, we used, uh, we will have a lunch box uh, here on the second floor, so we can stay still for two, two hours during the lunch. So we, we also, so in the morning session, actually we don't need to hurry either. So, uh, and uh, this is a bit early today, so uh, some uh, Korean participants will appear a bit later because they are coming from some other cities. So, uh, but uh, let us start uh, our first uh, school lecture by uh, Jan Haman uh, from University of, uh, yeah, New South, New South Wales. Okay, he will give a talk, a uh, lecture about cosmic microwave background. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give some lectures here. Um, let me see. There we go. Um, before I start, I'll have to apologize. I was uh, under the impression there would be a blackboard here, and so I only prepared blackboard lectures, um, supported with a few slides. Um, so my workaround solution is now to give blackboard lectures on my iPad. This is an experiment. I've never tried this before. I, I hope it works out. Um, right, so introducing the cosmic microwave background in 150 minutes is a bit of a challenge because obviously there's enough stuff to fill at least a whole semester's worth of lectures. Um, so I had to select um, which aspects to present. And um, obviously, I'm not going to uh, spend time on detailed derivations. But at the same time, I also want to make sure that you know what physical assumptions are behind the theory of the cosmic microwave background. Okay? Um, I will assume that all of you know general relativity and that all of you know had, have at least had a basic course in cosmology, but I am going to start at a, a, a pretty easy level, let's say, okay? So, um, first of all, a bit for the context and motivation. Obviously, um, we now know a lot about our universe, and one of the pillars of our knowledge about the evolution and composition of the universe is the cosmic microwave background. Do we have a pointer? Yes, okay. Um, and um, so one of the most basic things we know is that the universe is expanding. So in the past, that means the universe was smaller, denser, and hotter. So the further you go back in time, the more extreme the conditions were. And that allows us to eventually recreate conditions that cannot be probed in experiments uh, on Earth, right? So um, the LHC goes up to here, high energy cosmic rays go up to here, but cosmology in principle gives us an opportunity to probe physics at even higher energies. And the CMB is instrumental in that. So why is that? Um, well, How, how does the CMB come about in the first place? Um, if you heat the universe enough, then eventually you will ionize 
um, everything there is and the universe will become opaque. So if you reverse time, then the universe cooled down at some point so that uh, we no longer had free electrons and um, ions, but it became neutral. Okay? And this process is called recombination. And in this process, um, so high temperatures, ionized plasma, lots of scattering of photons. After recombination, neutral universe, the photons can propagate essentially unhindered. Okay? That means that today we are still able to look back up to this point. Yeah? Because those photons haven't interacted, haven't scattered with anything else in the meantime. On the other hand, it means, at least with electromagnetic waves, we can't look back further than that. So it's a bit like looking at a cloud, right? Um, within a cloud, you have lots of little droplets, lots of scattering of light, so you don't see what's happening inside the cloud. You can only see the surface of the cloud. But nevertheless, even the surface of the cloud can tell you something about what happens inside the cloud, right? So what we're looking for in the CMB is traces of physics happening at higher energies that they imprinted in the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so I'm going to, um, in the first part of these lectures, um, I will completely ignore um, any inhomogeneities and anisotropies and just assume the universe to be homogeneous and uh, then derive some of the properties of the cosmic microwave background. In the second part we will drop this assumption and go into the well, most interesting bit of the CMB actually, the anisotropies. And if there's time at the end um, I will tell you a little bit about how we actually get from observing the CMB with an experiment like Planck for instance um, to actually constraining cosmological parameters. So there are a few um, resources I can uh, recommend. There's chapter 8 of uh, Dodelson's Modern Cosmology. Um, there are some lecture notes by Daniel Baumann, um, which I can strongly recommend. Um, they're very pedagogical and have a lot of uh, derivations uh, of the details. Um, I also like the lecture notes by Anthony Chalinor and Hiranya Pyrus. Um, so I've mixed and matched a bit um, from, from all of these things. Okay, so. Let's start with the homogeneous bit. Um, and first we will recap some of the basics. And we will start with the geometry and energy content of the universe. Okay? So, if we want to describe the geometry of the universe, then we need to specify, um, we're in general relativity, we need to specify a metric. Um, now, in general, a metric has uh, 10 degrees of freedom, but uh, if we want to keep the problem manageable, then we need to make some assumptions uh, to assume some symmetries to keep it tractable. And the assumptions we will make is the so-called cosmological principle, 
and that stipulates that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Um, so in other words, no observer is special. No matter where you are in the universe, you will um, find identical conditions. Okay? We will also assume spatial flatness Um, this is just to make our life easier, um, but it's not a totally ad hoc assumption because this is actually um, a prediction of the generic models of inflation. Okay. Oops. And this is not a fundamental limitation. Of course, you can do the whole analysis also for, um, let's say, closed spaces or open spaces. Um, it just makes your life a lot harder. OK. With these assumptions, the most general metric we can write down is the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric. Oops. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's uh, essentially um, a Minkowski metric with a time-dependent bit describing um, the spatial part. So this function A of t here is the scale factor. So what this means is that distances between um, observers that are co-moving that have no relative velocity with each other can be time dependent. Okay. Now, it turns out that um, especially if you're looking at the perturbations, it's very convenient to um, introduce a different time parameter rather than um, the usual time and introduce the conformal time. So I'm going to do that here. So the conformal time is just defined by d eta is equal to dt divided by a of t. So if we plug this definition into the um, form of the metric up here, then we'll see what happens. In the conformal time, the metric, we just pull out the dependence of the um, scale factor. And in the brackets, we have something that looks like a Minkowski metric. OK. So now we have specified our geometry. And of course, in general relativity, Einstein's equations uh, relate the geometry to the distribution of matter via the stress-energy tensor. And uh, if our metric fulfills some um, some symmetry, um, has some symmetry properties, then of course the uh, energy momentum tensor must have the same symmetry properties. Okay? Um, so in Einstein's equations, we have the Einstein tensor, which is a function of g mu nu and derivatives. is equal to 8 pi g t mu nu, um, where g is Newton's constant. And t mu nu is the stress energy tensor. 
Okay, so given the high degree of symmetry of the metric, the stress energy tensor also has a very simple form. Um, and it's actually simplest to write it in a form that has one index upstairs and one index downstairs, sorry. So just like the metric, it's diagonal, and the naught-naught component is the energy density. And the spatial components along the diagonal are the pressure. So if we plug the metric um, and the, um, this form of the energy momentum tensor into the Einstein equations, then we end up with only two independent um, equations. Um, so Einstein's equations. lead to the Friedman equation. Um, So this is the Friedman equation in conformal time, and I've defined um, the conformal Hubble parameter as d by dA by d eta times 1 on A. Okay, so this is the conformal Hubble parameter. So this is the first equation, and the second equation can again be written in, in several forms, but uh, one of the most physically intuitive ones is the, uh, in the form of a continuity equation. So the time derivative of the energy density is given by minus 3h rho bar plus p bar. Okay, so essentially what this means is that the energy density and pressure of the matter in the universe determine the, the, scale, the function of the scale factor as a function of time, the evolution of the scale factor, or if you like, the geometry. Now, in a realistic universe, um, we won't just have one component, like not just matter or not just radiation or something, but a mix of components. And in that case, the total energy density is given by the sum over all species um, over the individual energy densities. And the same is true for the pressure. Now these are macroscopic quantities. We might also be interested in how these macroscopic quantities are related to microscopic quantities. 
Um, and the, the quantity that describes the microscopic physics of, uh, of a species is the phase space distribution function. Okay. which in general is a function of um, spatial position and momentum. And this is related, the, so the macroscopic quantities are related to that via a momentum integral. Okay? So for the energy density of some species as a function of position, We have a momentum integral over the phase space distribution function of that species times the energy of that particle as a function of momentum. We can write down a similar expression for the pressure. I will explain what GI is in a moment. And here the integral goes over the momentum squared over three times the energy. A bit more intuitive is perhaps, and I'm going to write that down as well, um, the number density And that's just the momentum integral over the distribution function. Okay, so I've introduced a quantity called G here. That's the number of internal degrees of freedom. So that could be, for instance, uh, the number of spin states that a particle can have. Right? Now, what do we know about the um, distribution function? Well, we know from thermodynamics, if a system is in thermal equilibrium, then the Oops. Distribution form, distribution function takes on the following form. Okay, so first of all, I've assumed homogeneity again, so there's no um, X dependence in here. I've introduced mu I, which is the chemical potential. Just because this is the most uh, general form, but in the following, I'm going to set mu I equal to zero again. Um, the reason is that we know for photons it's zero and um, the, the only particles in the universe that could have an appreciable uh, chemical potential are actually the neutrinos. Um, but for simplicity, I'm going to assume that they don't have any. Okay. Um, so here we have plus or minus one and which sign to use depends on 
the spin of the particles, so if, if it's bosons, um, we have a uh, minus here, and it becomes the, sorry, uh, this is just the Bose-Einstein distribution, and for fermions, we have a plus, and it's a Fermi-Dirac distribution. Uh, in which yep. sense, we are saying the universe is equilibrium, we know it's time-bearing. Yes. Um, so there cannot be global equilibrium because of the e existence of horizons, but there can be local thermal equilibrium. Every time? Anything. No, not, not at all times. And um, I, I will get to that in a moment. Um, at early times, however, when the density um, is very high and the temperature is very high, um, the scattering rate of uh, various processes, electroweak processes, for instance, is very high. So the system will equi equilibrate very quickly. In the late universe, that's no longer the case because um, eventually, once the universe has cooled down enough, once the density has become um, low enough, um, then a lot of these processes will end up becoming inefficient and different particle species will no longer be able to interact with each other or self-interact, um, if, if it's a self-interaction, right? Um, and so what, what we need to describe this process is an extra set of equations that cannot be the, the, um, the Friedman and continuity equation do not give us that type of information. Yeah? They only tell us how the total energy density and total pressure of all the stuff we have in the universe affects the metric, but they don't tell us how individual species, um, how the energy densities and, and pressures of individual species interact in, in with each other. Yeah? Okay, so this is actually the next point, interactions. Between species and the tool we need here is the Boltzmann equation. Okay, if we look at the um, universe at temperatures less than about 100 kilo electron volts, what kind of stuff do we expect to be in there? Well, we better have some baryons. So normal matter. And since 100 keV is well after Big Bang nuclear synthesis, the baryons will be in the form of hydrogen, deuterium, helium-3, and helium-4, plus some traces of lithium, okay? The baryons are, of course, also accompanied by electrons. because we want our universe to be electrically neutral. Um, we have photons. We also expect to have neutrinos. And then there's crazy stuff. <laughs> 
dark matter and dark energy. And of course these guys are all interconnected, they're all interacting gravitationally, right? So they all communicate with each other via the metric. But we also have direct interactions between different species. Okay, so for instance, the baryons and electrons interact via the Coulomb interaction. And photons and electrons interact via Thomson scattering. There is also interaction between photons and baryons, but um, that goes, if I remember correctly, like the cross-section goes like 1 over m or 1 over m squared. Um, so that's m a much weaker interaction than the one between photons and electrons. Okay, so in order to describe these interactions, we need the Boltzmann equation. And in the most schematic way, the Boltzmann equation is so on the left hand side we have an operator that acts on the um, momentum distribution of a species and on the right hand side we have an operator that does the same so this is the collision operator and this one is known as the Liouville operator So in general relativity, the Liouville operator looks uh, somewhat complicated. Um, P A D by D X alpha. Sorry. There's something wrong with the indices here, that should be beta and gamma. So these here are the Christoffel symbols. So of course in Minkowski space the Christoffel symbols are all zero and the Liouville operator is just that, that bit on the left and it's uh, relatively simple. Um, but in general relativity you do have to take into account the effects of gravity as well. Yeah. Um, so the collision operator um, encodes the interactions between different particle species and that can be related to the matrix elements of scattering processes. I'm not going to write this down here because it's a very very long term involving um, uh, several momentum integrals um, um, and it can often be condensed into something like uh, a thermally average cross-section. Okay. So these are basically the, the tools that we need. We have the Einstein equation, 
that tells us about the interaction between gravity or geometry and the total of the energy densities we have and we have the Boltzmann equation that tells us about the relations between the different um, ingredients of the stress energy tensor. Okay. Um, so we can often simplify the Boltzmann equation considerably. For instance, if we assume uh, homogeneity, then of course only the alpha equals zero component of the Liouville operator um, survives. And uh, so in a homogeneous universe, And then, of course, the only um, dependence of F we have is on energy. Yeah. And in that case, we can integrate over the momentum and express the uh, Boltzmann equation in terms of the number density. So Boltzmann equation. becomes something like d by dt of the number density plus 3 times 1 on a dA by dt times n is proportional to the momentum integral of the collision operator. Okay, and if we then assume that there are no collisions, so no collisions, and this is often referred to as free streaming, C of F is equal to zero, and then dN by dt plus three times one on A, dA by dt, times n is equal to zero. And we can rewrite this as one on a cubed d by dt n times a cubed is equal to zero, which means that n times a cubed must be a constant. So this, the, the, the message of this is essentially that the um, Number de the co-moving number density of particles is conserved if there are no interactions, yeah? Which makes sense. If there are no interactions, you don't lose particles or you don't create new particles. Okay, now let us apply this machinery to describe the recombination process and the decoupling of photons. So what's the process we want to look at? Um, let's ignore helium and the higher elements for now and just look at the recombination of hydrogen. Then the process we're looking at is a proton plus an electron goes to neutral hydrogen plus a photon. Yeah? And as long as you're at high enough temperatures, this process can go both ways. You can have recombination and emit a photon, or you can absorb a high-energy photon and ionize the neutral hydrogen. Okay. Um, in this case, the Boltzmann equation looks like this. So on the left-hand side, we have the 1 on A cubed d by dt n times a cubed, like we saw before. And on the right-hand side, we have um, so this is a thermally 
averaged recombination cross section. So sigma is the cross section and V is the velocity of the particles. Um, and here we have the number densities of electrons times the number densities of protons minus the equilibrium values of the proton, electron, and hydrogen number densities times NH. Okay, this can be rewritten in terms of the free electron fraction. Which is just defined as the number of electrons, number density of electrons divided by the number density of baryons. So if we do that, um, we find that the Boltzmann equation for the free electron fraction can be written as sigma V times NB times Okay, so the common prefactor is the uh, recombination cross-section and the baryon number density. And then we have two terms in the brackets. One term is positive, so this guy here is, has a positive sign. And if the change in free electron fraction is positive, that means this describes ionization. Okay, so this term increases the free electron fraction, and this term has a negative sign, so it decreases the free electron density, and therefore um, this term describes recombination. So let's look at the Behavior, okay, should also explain what some of the other things are. So this here is a factor of order one. Um, and eta b is the baryon to photon ratio. And we know that the baryon to photon ratio is a very small number. Okay, so eta b is something like 5.5 times 10 to the minus 10. So in other words, for each baryon, there are about 2 times 10 to the 9 photons. Yeah? So this prefactor is actually a very large number. Okay. I have also not defined this here. BH is the um, binding energy of hydrogen. And that's something like 13.6 electron volts. Okay, so how does this uh, equation behave at different temperatures? Let's look at very high temperatures first. <coughs> 
so a temperature is much, much larger than the binding energy, then this exponential factor is 1, um, and we are basically dominated by the large baryon to photon ratio there. Okay. Um, in this case, uh, we have an equilibrium. So ionization is, is very, very efficient. So basically, w whenever you have um, a neutral hydrogen atom forming, there will be plenty of high energy photons around to immediately ionize it again. Yeah? So in this case, um, you have equilibrium. between ionization and recombination. And that means Xe is roughly 1 and stays there too. Now what happens when we roughly reach the binding energy. Then this exponential factor there will start kicking in and will suppress the efficiency of ionization. So ionization becomes less likely to happen. Yeah? And What it means physically is if the temperature falls, drops below the binding energy, then the average photon will no longer have enough energy to ionize a neutral hydrogen atom. But that is the average photon. And we should keep in mind that we have this very large prefactor here. We have way more photons than we have um, baryons. And that means so, um, well, the, the photons follow a, um, a Bose-Einstein distribution, so there will always be a tail of high-energy photons. And since there are so many photons, the high-energy tail is, has still enough photons to efficiently ionize um, any neutral hydrogen that forms around this time. So, actually, you need to be quite a bit below the um, binding energy for ionization to actually become inefficient. So, in fact, only around 0.3 electron volts, and this corresponds to a temperature of 3,600 Kelvin, or a redshift of about 1300 um, we have ionization becoming inefficient so what that means is that the recombination term starts winning And we get dx e by dt less than zero. If we let the energy, the, the temperature drop a little bit further up to 10 to the minus 2 electron volts or so, um, we find that the entire right-hand side actually goes to zero. Yeah? So this has, uh, has two reasons. One is that the baryon density, um, of course, gets diluted by expansion, so the, the prefactor becomes smaller. But also, once, um, the, once Xe becomes small, um, the, rec the Xe squared term will no longer contribute as much. So in physical terms, 
what that means is that the electrons that haven't found anyone um, to any uh, proton to recombine with um, they're having trouble finding finding a friend to recombine because the density um, the number density of these has become so low yeah and this is known as freeze out so um, So the rate of change goes to zero and the free electron rate um, the free electron ratio goes to a constant which is in this case roughly 10 to the minus 4. So one in 10,000 electrons doesn't find a friend to recombine with and we're left with a low residual ionization um, of the <coughs> intergalactic medium. Okay, so if we want to sketch what this looks like, we can draw the logarithm of the free electron fraction as a function of redshift. <coughs> So at very high redshift and very high temperatures, um, we said the um, equilibrium value is 1. So all electrons um, are in the form of free electrons and there's no remaining, um, there's no neutral hydrogen. Um, this actually ignores the fact that we have helium. So if we take into account that there's helium, um, then the, the fact that for each helium nucleus there's two electrons means we, means we can actually end up with a free electron fraction that is higher than one. Yeah. So at very high red redshifts um, when helium is still ionized the um, uh, free electron fraction is uh, 1.2 or so. Okay. Then around um, a redshift of 10,000, we have the first step. We have helium 2 plus recombination. So here we form singly ionized helium. Then sometime around 2000, we have helium plus recombination. and the free electron fraction reduces to 1. And then around about 1300 or so, um, hydrogen recombination starts. So that's a fairly quick process and when, once we reach um, a redshift of, of about 100, um, you reach a residual um, relic density of free electrons of about 10 to the minus 4. So this is not the full story though because um, at very low redshifts um, eventually you will start forming stars. Yeah? And the first stars are very hot and inject a lot of energy in the forms of mostly ultraviolet photons into the gas and they ionize the gas again. So Today, actually, most of the gas in the universe is ionized. And this process is known as reionization and starts around a redshift of order 10 or so. Uh, 
However, that cannot be um, described with these simple um, measures because uh, obviously the formation of stars um, is a very complicated process and mixes different scales, right? So um, typically uh, the reionization, the time of reionization is treated as a free parameter, even though in principle it shouldn't be impossible to um, predict it from first principles. Okay, so this was recombination, and recombination is closely related to the decoupling of photons. So when we want to describe the decoupling of photons, we are looking at the scattering of photons with electrons. And the scattering rate here is given by the electron number density times the Thomson scattering cross-section. I forgot to say one thing here. Um, this sigma v, the recombination rate, um, I just assumed that we know that. In reality, um, of course, we don't know that. And it's a very, very complicated uh, affair to actually get a good estimate of the recombination rate. So recombination does not happen from the continuum to the ground state, because if you did that, um, you would create a, a high energy photon that would immediately ionize a, a, a neutral hydrogen atom again. Um, recombination actually happens uh, in a fairly complicated way um, from excited states and involves some forbidden transitions. And in order to properly calculate uh, and, and follow the recombination process, one has to solve a system of uh, Boltzmann equations where you have a Boltzmann equation for a very large number of excited states and include in the collision terms um, a very large number of transitions between these uh, between all of these states. Yeah? There are a few um, expert groups uh, who have done these calculations independently of each other um, using dozens of energy levels and hundreds of uh, of transitions between energy levels, and fortunately they they agree with each other, um, even though their work was done independently. Um, so now we believe we we understand the recombination process well enough, um, so that uh, the the, pre the theoretical prediction of uh, cosmic microwave background observables is not affected with respect to the data. Okay. Now, back to scattering. Um, let's see. Okay. So given the scattering rate, we can um, define the optical depth. <coughs> and the optical depth at a given time is just the integral from that time until today over conformal time of the scattering rate. 
So this describes the, how opaque the universe is as a function of cosmic time. Yeah? And the probability of a photon having scattered between eta and today is given by e to the minus tau. So this can be um, interpreted as the cumulative distribution function of the probability of the um, probability of a photon um, last scattering at time eta. Yeah. So this is known as the visibility function. <coughs> is the probability of a photon last scattering at time eta. <coughs> and how do we get from the cumulative distribution function to the, distrib to the proper distribution, distribution function? Well, we, uh, we take the derivative. So um, the visibility function g of eta is just given by minus tau dot of eta times e to the minus tau of eta. Okay, and if we calculate this, we find that this is a, a very sharply peaked function. Around eta of roughly um, 10 to the two megaparsecs or in terms of redshift, um, a redshift of about 1100. So that means that almost all of the um, CMB photons that we see today were actually emitted um, within a very, very short time span. Yeah, so the width of this in terms of redshift is about 10, and in terms of eta is about 10 megaparsecs. So the, the actual decoupling process is a very, very quick affair. And for that reason, it makes sense to speak about a last scattering surface. Yeah? Because the, the bit we can see in the CMB corresponds to um, a spherical shell that is extremely thin compared to its distance. Yep. Um, I don't think so. I can check that again. In my notes, I don't have a scale factor here. So this actually corres corresponds to the last scattering surface. 
Yes. Okay. So if I measure a CMB photon today, and then I ask myself at what redshift or at what time was it, um, was it emitted, yeah? Then this is a probability distribution function that gives the answer to that question, right? So the higher G of eta, the higher the probability that um, a photon was emitted at that time. Or rather the probability of a photon being emitted um, within a certain time span is given by the integral over this, uh, over this distribution function. Yeah? So basically this means that almost all of the CMB photons were emitted around this time. Yes. It has to because it's a um, it's a probability distribution. Yes. Um, again, obviously, if you take into account uh, reionization, this picture needs to be modified a little bit. So, with reionization, there would be a second peak at very late times, corresponding to so. Um, because some of the photons we observe today will have rescattered relatively recently. Yeah. And reionization, to a good part, um, contributes to the optical depth of the photons. But uh, so we know that only a relatively small fraction actually do rescatter. Um, so in the in our universe, tau is somewhere around five percent or so. Yeah, so it's a relatively small number, which is good, because if a significant fraction of the CMB photons were to rescatter, we'd get less information from the last scattering surface. Okay. So we, we briefly talked about this before. Before um, decoupling, obviously the um, photons and the electrons were interacting with each other very frequently. Um, so the um, distribution function of the photons and the electrons was the equilibrium one. After decoupling, there is no more interactions. The photons don't interact with each other and they don't interact with electrons anymore. So does it still make sense to assume that they follow um, the equilibrium distribution? The answer is yes, but with a twist. So they are no longer in thermal equilibrium, but they still follow an equilibrium distribution. So we have after decoupling um, so we know that after decoupling the energy of the photons goes like one on the scale factor yeah um, and so if we rescale the temperature parameter here, if we let T go to T on A, then this remains an equilibrium distribution. It remains a um, Bose-Einstein distribution, okay? So the consequence is that uh, the CMB retains uh, an equilibrium distribution with uh, 
rescaled temperature parameter. It's no longer temperature in, in the true sense of the word because there is no thermal equilibrium, right? Um, so this was one of the um, most central predictions um, of Big Bang Theory when, when people first um, predicted the CMB. And this was actually spectacularly confirmed in the, in the early 90s by the FIRES instrument aboard the COBE satellite. Um, so this is a plot of the frequency spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. So FIRES measured the intensity at, well, in, in many, many different frequency bands. And the error bars you see here are actually 400 sigma error bars, not one sigma error bars. If you were to plot one sigma error bars, the, the error bars would be thinner than the thickness of the line. So this is actually um, probably the um, most accurate example for a black body spectrum in, in all of nature. Yeah. And the temperature, temperature parameter um, is 2.725 Kelvin. Um, so this measurement was performed 30 years ago. Obviously, by now we have way advanced technology and would be able to um, make this measurement uh, with even smaller error bars. And this is actually interesting because um, it makes sense to look for small deviations from this black body spectrum. So how, how can that come about? So for instance, if shortly before um, recombination, shortly before decoupling, you have a process that injects energy into the photons, say for instance, some heavy particle decaying or something, and if there isn't enough time for the system to equilibrate, then you would not end up with a perfect black body spectrum, but rather with a black body spectrum plus some additions. So, um, like a very extreme example would be, say, if you had instantaneous decay of some heavy particle just before decoupling, then you would end up with an emission line somewhere in there. That's, that's not terribly realistic. Usually you would expect some amount of redistribution of energy, but uh, this can manifest, for instance, um, as a very small chemical potential um, in the uh, power spectrum. So this is something that is uh, actually under discussion now, um, especially since building such an experiment is given current technology, not terribly expensive. It's just terribly expensive expensive to um, send it to space and do the measurement. So. But this is also a, a small, a relatively small um, uh, detector. So potentially this could be piggybacked on another mission, yeah? just like it was for, for FIRES. So FIRES was only one of three experiments uh, on the COBE satellite. No. Um, WMAP and Planck um, only had a handful of frequency bands. Um, so they were not useful for actually measuring the frequency spectrum. Yeah? I, I will get back to that in my, in my next lecture. Um, so the reason why you need measurements at different frequencies is because in the sky you don't only observe the cosmic microwave background, but also foregrounds. And these foregrounds, so galactic foregrounds, for instance, they have a different color. So they have a different frequency 
dependence from the CMB. And by making measurements at different frequencies, you can disentangle the effect of the foregrounds from the underlying CMB signal. Yeah. Um, and the design was, uh, the design of both WMAP and, and Planck was inspired by the number of relevant foregrounds you expect, which for temperature is of order a handful, maybe five or six or so. So that means it's useful to have, say, maybe at most of order 10 frequency channels. Yeah. This, this is a different, um, this requires a, a different uh, experimental setup to, to have so many frequency channels. And that then, of course, go, goes at the cost of um, having more noise in your individual channels, which, is, which doesn't matter if you integrate over the full sky, as Fires did, but it does matter if you want to measure the um, temperature fluctuations of the CMB. Okay, so uh, I think I'm essentially out of time. So um, next time I will continue with the um, anisotropies, the physics of the uh, anisotropies um, of the cosmic microwave background. Of course, uh, starting from, um, again, Kobe, we know that the cosmic microwave background is not perfectly isotropic, but has small temperature fluctuations. So in some directions, um, it's about one part in 10 to the five hotter than average. In other directions, it's about one part in 10 to, in 10 to the five colder than average. So the blue spots here are the directions where it's a bit colder. The red spots are the directions where it's a bit hotter. And um, the, the physics that leads to this pattern of fluctuations, it's very interesting. And it can tell us a lot about uh, the universe as a whole and what it's made out of and what the original state of density fluctuations was. And that I will discuss tomorrow morning. Did I hear you correctly that um, of, of the CMB photons that are you would um, take today, roughly five percent of them have been scattered in this reionization of e to the minus 0.5, yes. E to the minus 0.5, which is roughly five percent, yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, and and so and that doesn't include all of these photons that are coming from these foreground sources that you just mentioned. That's right. Yes. And and so so these five percent of photons that are scattered at reionization, does that not, they, they then have to be subtracted out in order to get these nice, uh, to, to tell something about the surface of that scattering and to extract all these cosmological parameters. I guess this then complicates greatly your, your task. But the, the thing is, you can't subtract out the rescattered photons that rescatter due to reionization because they have the same energy spectrum as the original CMB photons. Um, so, what you see in here is a superposition of, let's say, 95% original CMB photons and 5% um, rescattered photons. And the effect of this uh, rescattering due to reionization is that they smooth out the structures that we see here to some extent on all but the very largest scales. And this is an effect that is clearly observed in the, um, in the temperature power spectrum and even more so in the um, polarization power spectrum. Um, so this is something that is being taken into account in the process of extracting cosmology from, from these data. Yeah. So if you go like, let's say a few billion years into the future, then actually most of the CMB photons will have rescattered and a lot of the original primordial information will have been erased 
So in a way, we're, we're, we're lucky to be living in this time and not 10 billion years down the road. Um, so I mean, usually you plot one sigma error bars, and these are just stretched by a factor of 400. No, no, no. Yes. It's, it's just so that you see that there is actually an uncertainty in the measurement. It's just extremely small. <laughs> 